In this video, I'm going to talk about history, and more importantly, historical sources. I'm going to put forward some of the things you should look for whenever you read anything which claims to be about the past. Citation, please! If the material has little or no citation, take it with a bucket of salt. All historians of worth will cite their sources to the point of obsession. The main reason for this is history is a social science and we want to be falsified. The quickest way of that is to list all of our sources clearly and concisely so that other people can find those sources and check them out. If there are no sources, then they are usually trying to hide something. But what if it's in a video, I hear you cry. Well, anyone making any kind of historical video for YouTube or wherever should either A. List their sources in the crotch bar or B, be able to PM their sources to you on request. I know I certainly can. Just the fact, man. While I understand that history can be a very subjective subject, its core should be as factual and as objective as possible. Look out for sentences like, in my view, I believe that, I would assert that, and similar. If these statements are not followed up with a clear indication of the evidence for those beliefs and a description of alternative hypotheses, then alarm bells should be ringing. Hypotheses and personal opinions are all well and good in history, but most good historians when writing will put massive landing lights around them so that you know it's their hypothesis and not something that they have strong evidence for. If they don't do that, wonder what's going on. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Historical books and films can claim the most extraordinary things. From simple things like witches' sabbats being historically true, through to aliens having nuclear wars in ancient India. The question is, how good is their evidence? And this is where a bit of digging is required. What are the sources for their claims? Now, if there's no citation, there's nothing you can do. Just throw it in a bin. It's unfalsifiable rubbish. But, if they have sources, check them out. Quite often, they're not good sources. A believer in the ancient nuclear war may cite high levels of radiation in the soil around the area of India. And while this may be true, they will ignore the myriad of natural causes, such as low-level meteorite explosion, which can account for it. In this case, Occam's razor is useful. If in doubt, check the citations, look up the sources, and also look at what other historians have to say about those sources. When a primary source is not a primary source. Often a claim will be made that research has been done from primary sources. But what is a primary source? A primary source is a source which comes from the time and place of the incident. It is not something which comes many years later. It is not something which comes from 2,000 miles away. It is a first-hand document which relates what happened in that time place. It could be a diary or an order book, it could be tax records or the marriage register, but it must be contemporary to the event. One of the problems in history is that the further back you go, the more compact and teeny tiny time becomes. So World War I, which was 70 years ago, seems like a long way in the past and we wouldn't dream of taking a document written in the 80s as a primary source. Yet the time between the Battle of Salamis where the Greeks finally beat the Persians in 480 BCE, and the death of Socrates in 399 BCE, is thought of as a click of the fingers, even though there's a gap of 81 years. Herodotus, the great father of history, didn't write a primary source of the Persian Wars, writing as he did some 40 years after the event. The compression of history is an easy mistake to make, and one that happens all too often. But bottom line, if they weren't there, it ain't primary. If it stands alone or is in a crowded room. If the number of sources used by a historian is less than two, set those alarm bells ringing. Now, it may well be that that historian is doing an in-depth analysis of one source, in which case that's fine. But if he's trying to base an entire historical examination on a single piece of material, one source, then that's poor academic practice and bad history. In this case, look for other sources. Nine times out of ten, they'll contradict what that historian said. Because if there were other sources and he's leaving them out, he's leaving them out for a reason. 
If it has many sources, are they contradictory? Does it have so much information from so many places that the text simply doesn't add up? Does it make no sense to repeat or blatantly contradict itself? Either this scenario, or the one source only, is a plain example of Does the writer have an ulterior motive? And this is especially true of those extraordinary claims. Who wrote the book? Are they a sci-fi alien panspermia obsessed nut job? Are they a right-wing bigot? Do they have something to sell and does the text read as though they are trying to proselytise? Sometimes a quick look, Facebook, Google, at the writer's background and you'll have all the answers you need. And you can see the writing <laughs> in the context of which it was written. And so therefore, sniff out the smelly parts. Go further, who wrote the sources? And what was the motivation of the writing of those sources? Do those sources fit? the author's world view a little bit too conveniently. A great example of this would be the Hitler Diaries. These sensational documents told us everything we wanted to hear about Hitler. That he was a megalomania, a sexual deviant, a psychopath. A little too good to be true? Well, as it turns out they were, and they were shown to be false partly because historians spotted that they were too good to be true and so investigated. If the sources fit the author's worldview too perfectly, check, check and check again. We can all be guilty of placing our subjective viewpoint into our writing, but a good historian will struggle hard to avoid this mistake. Conclusion. And this brings me to my point. I'm sure you knew there was one. Of all the kinds of texts ever written, with the historical bent of all the sources out there, there is one above all, one kind, that is guilty of all of the mistakes I just mentioned. They are religious texts. Most religious texts are a mixture of genuine history, mythology, philosophy, prophetic writings, poetry and plain fiction, and the Bible is certainly no exception. Its extraordinary claims are unfalsifiable. Its authors were clearly biased, it is filled with assertion without any evidence. None of it is a primary account. It is self-contradictory, clearly born out of far too many sources in places, such as in Genesis and in fact most of the Old Testament, or else it's a single source with nothing to back it up, as in the writings of Paul. And sticking with the writings of Paul, much of these have been shown to be forgeries. The entire book is one extraordinary claim after another, which the evidence does simply not uphold. I don't mean to pick on the Bible. There are plenty of other woo-woo books out there. I don't even need to pick on religious texts. Most of them are the worst of these, but there are woo-woo history books. There are people who interpret archaeology really, really badly and lead to nonsense like 2012 panics. Um, all I'm saying is, please, the next time you come across something about history, Apply your critical skills to it that bit more than you might something else. And the moral of the story is don't take any of it at face value. Read and think. Until next time, don't be an intellectual homeopath. You won't get smarter the less you know. See ya. for that.